This morning's scripture is going to be read from the book of Acts. And if you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn there. Uh, It's getting towards the end of your Bible. It's the first book after the Gospels. And we're going to read from Acts chapter 4. We'll start in verse 32. I love to hear the Bible pages turning. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Um, This is the word of God. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's bow for another word of prayer. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for such a move of your Holy Spirit as we see here in Acts chapter 4. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak to us this morning. Uh, Holy Spirit, we know that you're here in the room, you're in our very bodies. Won't you speak straight to our heart? You have the benefit of being able to skip the ears. And so please speak straight to our heart. I pray, Jesus, that you would bind my lips and my tongue, that no false word might pass from them, uh, that you would even move me aside completely and, and speak. Show yourself to be glorious this morning. In your great love, we pray. Amen. Uh, So many of you know my son, Ellis, and he is two years old, and he's really a delightful kid. Um, He does have one flaw. Okay, he's got a lot of flaws, but he's two, so that's okay. Uh, But he has one flaw in particular that is soon to be challenged in a very deep way. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, one of our friends came over, and she brought her son, who's just a little bit younger than Ellis, and y'all, the audacity of this kid. This kid walked up into Ellis's house, picked up one of his 10 gazillion billion trillion toys, and tried to play with it. Can you believe the nerve of some people? Ellis did what any of us would have done. He ran over as fast as his little legs could carry him. He ripped it away and said his uh, toddler's second favorite word, mine. Second only to, no, yeah, you, (laughs) you got the assignment. He nearly knocked this kid to the ground, ripping his toy away uh, because it was mine. Ellis is flaw that is about to be challenged is that he has not yet learned how to share. Uh, He has not yet learned generosity. And and I say that this is about to be challenged in a deep way. I have to do this here because I don't make posts on social media. Uh, And I've been able to tell many of you, but, but I just wanted to share with all of you that we're expecting in a few months Ellis to have to really learn how to share everything he has as he becomes a big brother. And Kelsey's so embarrassed. Uh, But thank you so much for sharing in our joy. 
uh, hey, that kind of sharing feels good. Well, uh, Ellis... He's, uh, he's about to learn. I'm most afraid of him having to learn how to share mommy and daddy. I, I, I think that's going to be maybe kind of uncomfortable for mommy and daddy. But, um, but it's going to be good for him to learn how to share. And, and just so that I'm not dragging his name through the mud while he's back at Cove Kids trying to learn about Jesus, I'll tell you <laughs> that Ellis comes by it honestly. Uh, particularly, this has been passed down to him from one of his parents more so than the other. And if you know my wife, Kelsey, then you know that it's not her. Um, <laughs> generosity and sharing is not one of those spiritual disciplines that has come easy for me. I wasn't born with a generous spirit. And, and the Lord has been at work in me. I'm growing in the grace and knowledge of God. I'm being sanctified by the truth. I'm being made perfect in love. God, uh, Jesus is conforming me into the image of God that I was created to bear. But sharing and generosity has not always come easy for me. Throughout my life, I've had a bent towards selfishness. Uh, y- y'all know the five love languages, right? And, and one of them is gifts. And I have never been able to claim that as one of my top love languages because as much as I really enjoy receiving gifts, giving gifts doesn't quite do it for me. And I'll just confess that. I love to receive gifts and I don't enjoy giving them quite as much. I'm growing in that. Remember, I'm being transformed by Jesus. But I think Jesus said in somewhere like the Bible that it is more blessed to give than to receive, and I just can't wait for him to teach me that a little more, Uh, because in my flesh, it feels more blessed to receive than to give, and maybe you can relate to that. Uh, I've had a bent towards selfishness throughout my life. I have been known in my past to try to hide like really good food or desserts from other people so that I can enjoy more of it myself. And we can laugh about this, um, but here's the really ugly part of, of this truth about our selfishness. Selfishness is completely incompatible with God. You know what I mean? Selfishness is completely incompatible with God. The God we love, the God we know, the God we serve is a generous God, and selfishness is completely incompatible with him. When we allow ourselves to be a conduit of selfishness into the world, we're not being a conduit of the Holy Spirit's power and grace poured into the world like in Acts chapter 4. When we uh, allow selfishness to enter into the world, we are becoming a conduit for the work of the devil. Selfishness is completely incompatible with God. Uh, You know, the early church in Acts chapters 2, really through like chapter 7, is the birth of the church. The church's birthday is here in Acts chapter 2. And in chapter 2 and chapter 4, we have this classic picture of a revival in the church and and, an awakening. And it's something that the trends that we see in Acts chapter 2 and 4 are trends that we see throughout revivals and awakenings throughout church history. And there are some things that we typically think of when we think of a revival. Uh, The first thing for me that I think of is is I think of conviction of sin that leads to confession and repentance and forgiveness. Conviction of sin that, that leads people to confess, to turn away from their sin and come back home to Jesus and find his total and complete forgiveness. When there's a revival, there's always confession, repentance, and forgiveness. The other next thing that I think of is there is a proclamation of the gospel, and the gospel is made more accessible in a couple of ways in revivals throughout church history. One of those ways is through the gift of tongues. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, the first thing, almost the first thing that happened is people began to speak in languages they didn't know because there were people there who needed to hear the gospel, and the only way for that to happen is if someone who had the gospel message could deliver it in their own language. 
When there is a revival, there is the proclamation of the gospel and made more accessible. The other way it's made more accessible throughout revivals all across history is through the gift of prophecy. And I'm not talking about predicting the future. The the gift of prophecy that makes the gospel more accessible is when someone is able to proclaim the gospel in a way that makes perfect sense to you that fits you like a glove and they shouldn't have been able to to speak it in that way they shouldn't have known how to be so applicable to you but they did god is giving them the gift of prophecy that makes the gospel more accessible to people so there's confession and repentance there's proclamation and accessibility of the gospel and the third thing that i think about is a demonstration of the Lord's power through healings. And that might be this, the sick being healed or those who are injured, their injuries going away. Souls and bodies healed in a demonstration of God's power. That is what happens in Acts chapter 2. Those are the things I think about when I uh, think about revivals. But there's one other thing that happens in the exact same flow of story here in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4 that that isn't one of the first things I think about when I think about an awakening of the church, but but it always happens. Here's what it says in Acts chapter 2 in uh, verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, this doesn't mean like, oh my goodness, we have so much in common. It doesn't mean that all these believers were together because they all had the same life stage or the kids the same age or they all liked the same sports team. It means that all of their possessions were held, not in individual possession, but held in common possession. So anyone who had a need, they had just as much a right to someone else's belongings as the person who owned them did. And this wasn't forced upon the church. This is what naturally sprung forth when the Spirit awakened the church. It continues in verse 45. It says that the church sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And this happens again in Acts chapter 4. And there's another kind of mini revival. It's only two chapters later from Pentecost, but what's happening in the passage that we read right before the sermon, uh, right before this verse that we started with, is that the believers have gathered for a prayer meeting. They have been proclaiming the gospel. The church has been growing, and the, the Roman Empire has responded with persecution, and the church realized, if we keep doing this, our lives are in danger. And so they gathered for a prayer meeting, and the focus of their prayer was to ask God, won't you please give us boldness to continue proclaiming the gospel, even if it costs us our life? And here's what happened at the end of their prayer meeting uh, in chapter 4, verse 31. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Now, can you picture that? Can you picture that maybe... If that were to happen, if we were gathered on a Friday night for a prayer meeting and we were just interceding for our community and praying, God, please use us to carry the gospel with boldness to people who don't know you. And we said, in Jesus' name, we pray, amen, and then the room shook. That'd be like God saying a big, yes, your prayers are answered. Go forth with boldness. Uh, This is going to work out. The, The room was shaken, and they, it continues, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And then we get this passage that sounds very similar to the passage in Acts chapter 2. It says in verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. No one said, mine. No one claimed that their possessions were their own. They shared everything They had, and it continues in the middle of verse 33. It says that God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So when we think of revival, we think of Uh, repentance and confession and forgiveness. We think of proclamation and accessibility of the gospel, and we think of works of power of the Holy Spirit in, in healing. But also, when the move of the Spirit awakens the church, every time radical generosity springs forth. 
in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 4, and in real revivals across church history, when there is a move of the Spirit, radical generosity springs forth. Now, I feel very blessed to be among you, the people of covenant, because I just want to honor you. You are a generous church. The ways in which you give of your own money, of your own time, of your own energy to bless those in need is really, really wonderful. But we're taking a turn here in this sermon today. I want us to move from hearing about the early church, to doing a little bit of self-reflection. And we're going to do it in this way. I'm going to ask you a question. This is a hypothetical question. Do you think, hypothetically speaking, there's a world in which God might ask you, invite you to sell your house, buy and move into a cheaper house, and use all the profits of those transactions to give to those in need. I'm just asking, is this, is, I'm not saying God's doing this. Is there a world in which our God, the God that, that we know and love, would do something like that? I think so. So now I'll ask us the next natural question, the fun one. Uh, if God were to invite you into that sort of ministry, what would be your answer? I'll just speak for myself. If God were to appear to me in a dream tonight or in my prayers tomorrow morning and say, Zach, there's a need in your community. I want you to sell your house move all your stuff into a cheaper house and use all the proceeds not to invest in another property, not to invest in stocks or anything, not to put in in an account, but to use all the proceeds to meet the needs of the poor in your community. I think that I would probably say, oh God, I don't... uh, I think I'm just making this up, God. I don't, I don't think that's really you. I think I would say no, and I would find some way to say no, whether I'm just saying that wasn't really you, God, or surely you know, I'm, I'm misinterpreting something here, or, or let me wait and see until I see who the needy person is, and if I can you know, find it in myself because of compassion to do this. I think that I would say no. Where I am today in my sanctification I think that I would say no if God made this invitation to me. Where are you at with this? I know that there are some of you in the community, uh, maybe you have actually done this very thing that is being described here in Acts. Maybe you have actually sold some extra piece of property that you have or sold a a rent house in order to give money to someone in need. And, And God bless you. You are a gift to our community. And if that's you, if that's where you are in your generosity, then then you already know the words of Jesus in Matthew 6 that says, when you give, don't don't blow the trumpet and let everyone know. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing uh, because it's your father who's going to give you your reward. And and so you don't need to, to raise your hand, but if that's you, God bless you for what you're doing. And for those of us who are like me, who are uh, feeling like if God were to call us to generosity in this way, I, I'm, I wouldn't be ready. It makes us ask the question, if this is something God might do and we believe we might ought to be ready for, how do we get from here to there? How do we grow in generosity? Any of us might be at different places in, in our comfort with generosity for the poor with aligning with the power of God. It says that the grace of God was so powerfully at work in them all that neediness evaporated. There were no needy persons among them. And so when we are exercising selfishness, we're hindering the grace of God from flowing through us. 
So how can we grow in selflessness and a generosity of spirit? I think there are two main ways we can do this. Let's start with the first one. The first way that we can grow in our generosity, uh, it sounds very simplistic, uh, but it's very powerful. You practice generosity. Generosity, being generous, is much like any sort of skill, any sort of strength exercise. When, when you exercise by lifting weights, you put your body through just enough discomfort to break down and come back stronger. And, and if you want to grow in your generosity, you can find the zone of generosity that makes you feel just a little bit uncomfortable. And, and this, is, this was C.S. Lewis' advice. It's not mine. You can find the zone of generosity that makes you just a little uncomfortable and practice Practice giving in that zone. It's okay if you're not at the place of, of let me sell my extra rent house and give all the money to the poor today. God may not even ever ask you to do that, but you can grow in your generosity through practicing giving things away in a space that's just, just uncomfortable enough to make you grow and just see what happens when you practice. There, there's a really cool opportunity that we have right now if you're a parent uh, that I think is especially a wonderful way to disciple your kids in the discipline of generosity. We just announced earlier in worship the Team Christmas Drive. And the reality is that many of you in the room could just buy so many of the gifts on the list and it wouldn't be a burden on your budget. And your kids would have fun with that and that would be great. But think about this. What if you looked over the list with your kids and you gave them the opportunity to pick out some gift that they wanted to give to a needy family through team. And then instead of buying that for your kid to give to team, what if you invited them to use their own money to buy it? And what if you did that in such a way as to really practice this Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4 reality? What if you invited them to go amongst their possessions, gather up things that they don't think they need anymore, and sell them to use the profits to buy a gift for someone else? And that could look like a garage sale. That could look like you buying them from them and then you know donating the toys to team or to Goodwill or something. What kind of church do you think we would have 20 years from now if all of us taught our kids to be generous in such a self-sacrificial way when they're kids. That would be wonderful. You grow in generosity through practicing generosity. The, the second way that we grow in generosity, and, and this is where I'm going to end today. You grow in generosity by being the recipient, the needy recipient of generosity. You might say, well, you know, Pastor Zach, how do I actually make that happen? I'm not saying that you need to go look for candidates to give you money. Not at all. Remember when I said that selfishness is incompatible with God? That's because God is a generous God. And the end of the line of generosity, if you were to follow generosity all the way to its conclusion, you know what that would be? Giving your own life for someone else. Being so generous as to hold nothing back, not even your own life. We serve a generous God. And we are needy people. We are all born sinners in need of a Savior. And God didn't have any ounce of selfishness. If he did, he never would have died for you and me on the cross. In the most generous act that the world will ever know, God generously gave his own life so that you could exchange your death for his life. Brothers and sisters, when we think deeply upon the generosity that we have received from Jesus, we will grow in our generosity. When we hold things back from those in need, we are forgetting 
that God held nothing back from us in our need. And so if you want to grow in your generosity, spend deep time in, in the quiet, in the lonely place, in the secret place with God, just reflecting on his great love and his generosity of spirit toward you. May we all grow into bearing the image of God that you were created to bear by growing in our generosity through practice and through receiving. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus. I confess that I hold things back from those in need. And I'm so grateful that even though I so clearly don't deserve it, you held nothing back from me in my need. Won't you please help me to look a little more like you? Help me to see the needy in the community around me. There, there are so many needs, Lord, and no one person of us can meet all of them. But just maybe you have specific needs that are, that are lined up for specific people to meet. You are the great facilitator, the great connector, the great orchestrator of needs being met. And so help us to be conduits of your unhindered grace for the needy among us. And God, as we continue into this time of offering, uh, I pray, Lord, for the gifts that are given. Won't you please multiply them and, and send them forth to bear fruit in this community, in your kingdom. And won't you please bless the givers as well. Show them that you're trustworthy and that you set us free uh, when we enter into the act of giving things away. We love you. Amen.